Hey, YouTube and Instagram, it's Gordon Miller. Hey, how are you doing? So, uh, this is, I guess, uh, live at 3.42. <laughs> so, um, I, uh, I have, a, requ I have a, um, a request that some people have, have given via Quora that I turned into a couple of answers. And I felt that, you know, well, why not answer it uh, here? Uh, and provide a short video. So this won't be a typical hour-long video like we've seen before. Uh, it will be more of a, um, uh, you know, more concise video. So the, um, the request was uh, talking about uh, what, do, what they need to know when they buy a house or a car. And uh, so, there are, you know, the, uh, when you buy a house or a car, it is probably... Uh, the two largest purchases that anybody typically makes. And it's really important to kind of understand uh, the role of, of that purchase. And the comments, some of the comments that I got from my, um, from my uh, Quora answers uh, really kind of concerned me. Let me turn this off here. There we go. That way I don't end up with this sort of blue cast on that. So the light coming in over here is kind of bad enough. But uh, anyway, so uh, so we're going to talk about what it, what you need to know if you're going to buy a house or a car. You know, probably two of the largest purchases that people are going to make. And uh, so I get these, these kind of questions all the time. Hey, you know, um, this house, uh, you know, I'm going to buy a house because it's an investment. So first of all, a house is not an investment, not typically in most places in the country. Uh, and, uh, and so the problem that you run into is that it just isn't. I mean, uh, it's not going to appreciate as fast as uh, other things. You're going to pay an enormous amount of money and in interest. And so um, I did this early on. Here, let me, this is kind of annoying me. All right. All right. There you go. That's a little better. Yeah, that was just too much light. So, anyway, um, the uh, getting back to buying a house or a car, uh, and there are a couple things that people sort of need to know. Uh, it's a struggle starting to work each day. How can I overcome that? All right. Well, I'll get to those kind of questions here uh, in a minute. But I'm going to focus right now on buying a house or a car. So everybody thinks so their house is an investment. Your house is a liability. Uh, an investment is something that makes you money. Uh, a liability is something that costs you money. And so uh, typically, uh, you're going to pay your mortgage. And typically, you're going to buy a house. So the example that I gave the detailed information on earlier today was somebody had asked a question about, uh, you know, if I buy a house for a million dollars, uh, you know, w when, when, at what income level is it okay to buy a house for a million dollars, basically? And, uh, you know, a million dollar house is really, really kind of the exception rather than the rule, unless you're in some kind of major metropolitan area, a really expensive place. But those, you know, the ones I did the math for. But if you do it, if you buy a house for a million dollars, you're going to have to put at least 20% down. So you're going to have to put $200,000 down. Uh, and, um, and then you are going to end up having a mortgage for $800,000. The problem is, is that by the time you're done, you will have paid over $1.3 million, uh, for that $800,000. So you will have paid another, uh, five or $600,000 in interest, depending on what your overall, um, uh, what your amortization schedule is and whether you have a 30 year or a 15 year loan. So my recommendation has always been that everybody have a uh, 15 year mortgage. And of course, when you do a 15 year mortgage on the million dollar house, uh, my answer showed that uh, it was $5,900 a month without in taxes or insurance or anything else, just the actual mortgage payment. And I think that's absurd. I mean, that's obscene. Uh, I always recommend that everybody end up doing uh, a mortgage that's 25% of their take-home pay. And as somebody commented and reminded me, they're like, dude, nobody's got that kind of money. Everybody's doing 50% of their gross and, you know, of their gross salary. And I'm like, that's just, that's a recipe for disaster. Uh, that's how people ended up house poor during the real estate, uh, you know, debacle in 2008. So, 
you know, I think that one of the things that I've recommended to people is that uh, you not do a 30-year mortgage no matter what. Because, uh, you know, if you, if you do a 15-year mortgage instead of a 30-year mortgage, you're going to pay more in payments. That's true. Uh, it, you know, that same million-dollar house is something like $3,800 a month as opposed to $5,900 a month. So it's $2,100 a month more. Uh, but you pay it off in 15 years. Your equity basis in the house is a lot higher. Uh, you save yourself $680,000 in payments. Uh, and I, I just think that, you know, people don't understand uh, the reality uh, of that. Of course, everybody's like, well, dude, you know, I can't afford $5,900 uh, a month. Well, that's great. So if, if your house is a half million dollars, then your mortgage payment would be, you know, about three grand, uh, you know, less, so a lot less than that. Uh, and I think that, you know, those are more realistic numbers in terms of, you know, the average house in America is just under $300,000. I think it's around 280000 and uh, and most people can live comfortably in a house that's half a million dollars. The particular example that I was being given or, or somebody asked about was in the uh, in the San Francisco area uh, where housing prices are ridiculous uh, in L.A. and New York and San Francisco. It's hard to find anywhere to live, you know, even in Miami, that's uh, less than a million dollars. It's just not uh, it's not possible in, in to find a decent place for, you know, less than a million bucks. And um, they were talking about the fact that in the San Francisco area, at least, uh, one of my good friends had said that uh, they were giving 80%, uh, even as much as 90% of your uh, gross revenue uh, to um, get qualified for your mortgage. And I just don't see how that's even possible. You know, most people are going to pay more than 10% in tax. You're going to pay, I mean, most California has a 10%, uh, you know, states, you know, income tax. So I don't know how in the world you pay 90% of your income, uh, you know, and then pay a 10% state of California sales or uh, income tax on top of that. So, uh, you know, all of that disturbs me on so many levels. It's just not even funny. Uh, but, uh, the, the major point that I wanted to make was, is that it's important if you're going to buy a house to understand that, uh, you need to buy a house on a 30 year mortgage. And they're like, well, I, I can, I can't afford the house that I want, uh, on those terms. Yeah, I know. I mean, it just, you know, you can afford a lot less, but I think that people have a tendency to buy houses that are a lot more house than they need. Uh, and I think in the long run, since they don't appreciate, you know, your house that you buy for a million dollars isn't going to become magically become worth two million dollars, you know, further down the road. So your investment, your investment in a house isn't going to double. But if you buy Apple stock or Tesla stock, or you you invest in a uh, in an index fund of the Dow or the S and P five hundred or something like that, those are going to double. Those are going to triple. You know, over a period of 10, 15, 20, you know, years, those are going to double and triple and, and you're going to be left with an enormous amount of upside that you're not going to get out of your house. So you're going to sink a lot of money up front. So that $200,000, if it was well invested at 7% or so uh, a, a year uh, over a period of, you know, 21 years, uh, you know, as you do your 15 year mortgage, uh, if you invested just the initial sum into that, rather than buy a house, then that 200 is going to become, um, 400, the 400 is going to become 800, uh, every seven years, uh, it typically doubles. And, uh, thanks to the joy of compounded interest, you know, and if you were going to put, you know, an extra $2,100 a month into it, like your extra payment, then you're going to see that grow even more. The problem is, is that, uh, you know, you don't want to necessarily hope that your investments grow faster than, uh, than you know, the house you're in. And 90% of all of your interest is paid in the first 10 years. So if you end up not living in the house at least 10 years, majority of all the payments you made went to interest and not to principal because it's not a simple interest loan for a mortgage. It is an accelerated principal loan and you're going to pay 90% of your interest payments in the first to 80, 90% in the first 10 years. So you pay almost no principal. So 
if the house doesn't significantly increase in value, you're going to pretty much be able to, you still owe roughly the amount you paid for your house uh, 10 years later. And uh, so that's the part that people don't understand. It is a serious issue in terms of getting yourself into these problems. And uh, so uh, in terms of, so the question that I have is, uh, am I talking about people in the U.S. only? Yes, I mean, I, I, my experience has been with folks in the U.S. Uh, it's different in other places. I know in other places they, they look at uh, people paying for houses uh, out of pocket. Uh, people don't like to rent in some places. Uh, people prefer to buy. In some places they pay outright. Uh, and in some places the appreciation is different. So I'm talking primarily in the United States. So, but... So anyway, the, the, the major, first major thing to get your arms around is the idea that a house is not an investment, period. A house is a place to live, find one you like, you know, enjoy it, but understand if you're not going to be there 10 years, if you don't have a 15-year mortgage, you are going to pay majority of your payments in the first 10 years is going to be interest only, and you are not paying on the, down on the principal, so if it doesn't go up in value substantially, you have paid a bunch of money for nothing. And so that's an important aspect to understand about the um, about a house. And so people are talking about, well, if I don't put 80, 20% down, you know, then you got private mortgage insurance, you've got your regular insurance, you've got your taxes, which can be ridiculous. I, I, we were looking at million dollar houses in the Pittsburgh area. The taxes were 40,000 a year. 40,000 a year. I mean, it's in obscene tax levels. And, you know, the real estate agent was like, yeah, but after you paid it for 10 years, then you don't pay any taxes. <laughs> I was like, yeah, okay, well, that's great. So after I paid 400,000 in property taxes, so essentially 40% of the value of the house in taxes, I don't have to pay anymore. You know, okay, great. That's assuming that that's where I want to live for the rest of my life. I mean, that's a ridiculous notion. So uh, I think that the idea that, so the idea of, of what do you have to do in terms of people that are, um, are buying houses and buying cars, these are things you need to understand. You know, a house is not, a, uh, is not an asset uh, in most cases. It's a liability. You pay your mortgage every month. And, uh, and so, uh, so anyway, the, the important thing, though, is that if you're going to get a mortgage, uh, you know, uh, make sure that your more that your mortgage payment is no more than twenty five percent of, if not your net income, at least no more than twenty five percent of your gross income. Uh, you know there are people that will do forty percent of your gross in, gross uh, income. I definitely would not do that. I think that that doesn't leave you enough to put twenty percent into savings and investing and things like that. Uh, again, I believe people should live on about half of what they make, uh, and so uh, I don't think that that's um, a decent way to do that. So that's, you know, part of, uh, of, of the equation. And people are talking about success and being able to put money into their businesses and, and being able to, you know, provide for their families and things like that. Part of the problem is, is that way too many people are, uh, are house poor and, uh, and they, they've invested a great deal of money in their house. Hey, Dick, good to see you. Thanks for joining. Appreciate that. I saw you sign in. So um, the important thing that people need to know is that uh, don't spend too much money on your house and, and make sure you get your, your mortgage as a 15-year mortgage and make sure you get something you can afford. And, uh, and so, uh, again, we talked about it being 25% of your, uh, of your gross income at the very most. Uh, and uh, don't ever go over the 40%. There Again, there's some places that'll do 50 or 60% of your gross income, depending on what your income is. Uh, and I just don't think that that's enough to pay for food and, and uh, other things like that. You, again, you got uh, maintenance and repairs and insurance and taxes and a bunch of other stuff on your house that's not just the mortgage payment. So uh, those things play a role as well. So no more than 40%, preferably around 25%. Okay, so that's the house. So we talked about, you know, for the last 15 minutes, we've talked about the house side of the equation. So now let's talk about your car. And, um, and again, you know, this is, these, these percentages are the same whether you have uh, two incomes or one. Uh, obviously, if you have two incomes, you have more money to put towards something and the numbers, percentages remain pretty much the same. But understand that 
you know, you know, spouses die, you get divorced, you know, stuff happens. Um, you know, uh, it, it's just a reality. So, you, you know, you don't necessarily want, uh, to end up relying on both incomes any more than you have to, but you know, if you do, then that's fine. Just understand that there's an inherent risk associated with that. So the, um, so let's talk about your car. Now, first of all, anybody who buys a brand new car, uh, regardless of make, model, whatever, anybody that buys a car and drives it off the showroom floor, doesn't matter if they paid $30,000 for it or $50,000 or $100,000 or $250,000. Anybody that buys a brand new car, drives it off the showroom floor, is an idiot. And, uh, you know, the reality is, is that um, the depreciation curve uh, is optimized between the third and fifth year uh, of the car's life. So uh, right now it's 2020. Uh, the optimal cars out there that have depreciated a lot, still have a great deal of value, uh, are ones that are uh, between 2015 and 2017 cars. Uh, and typically you can save around 30%. In some cases, you can even save as much as 40%, uh, depending on what it is. And, um, and you're looking for something that's typically uh, about 30,000 miles. Uh, you're looking for somebody who put uh, between 10 and 15,000 miles a year at most. Uh, and so if you have something that's under 30,000 miles, that's three years old, uh, they put you know, around 10,000 miles a year, that's a pretty decent car. And uh, you definitely don't want any car that's more than five years old that's more than 50,000 or 60,000 miles. Uh, you don't want to necessarily, you know, because, again, it's going to require a great deal more maintenance. Uh, it's going to figure into the calculation. Although, I mean, you can buy a car that's 10 years old that, uh, you know, it comes way down in value. You've got, you know, saved 70% or so uh, on that car. It's back to 30% of its original value. I mean, I've even seen cars that are, you know, seven, 10 years old, that used to be a $100,000 car that's now down in the $30,000 range. Now, those cars typically may have 75,000 miles or more on them, uh, even 100,000 miles, and then they're going to require a significant amount of maintenance. Now, you know, my favorites have been things like BMWs or Mercedes. Uh, I don't think I would ever own another Mercedes out of warranty based on my last experience. And I know people, some of you have said I've had bad experiences with um, BMWs and uh, some people claim that they've had terrific experience with Mercedes. I've had nine Mercedes and 11 BMWs and every single Mercedes I've owned has been a nightmare. And uh, now granted, most of my Mercedes have been AMGs and most of my BMWs have been M cars, uh, you know, M3s, uh, you know, and, and 7 Series and my X5M and things like that have all, were all phenomenal cars. Uh, so, you know, I think that, you know, those are, uh, those have been the exceptions rather than the rules. So in terms of, you know, uh, of great cars, I think you have to figure out, you know, what you like. I mean, obviously Hondas and Toyotas and things like that, you know, whether it's a Toyota Camry or a Honda Accord or Honda Civic, uh, have been really good. Uh, premium brands like Jaguar that lose, 70% of their value in the first five years. In a lot of cases, you can have a hundred thousand dollar Jaguar. You can buy that's seven years old. That's you can buy for 30 grand. The problem is, is you're going to end up spending an enormous amount of money on maintenance. And, uh, you know, I, I just don't, you know, I don't recommend some of these cars that are past the 10 year mark, uh, that may end up, uh, costing you an enormous amount of money in maintenance. But, um, you know, the, the optimal part of that curve, uh, is something three to five years old. I always recommend that somebody uh, buy a car uh, that costs no more than $50,000 out the door. So if that's a $100,000 car that now is only worth 50 and you buy that $50,000 car, uh, I recommend going to your credit union. Any car that um, is under a certain amount of mileage, under 100,000 miles, I think, and is less than 10 years old, uh, they can finance that car for like 2.9%. Uh, new cars, they can actually finance for like 0.9%. Uh, and uh, so there shouldn't be any reason to buy a car for more than $50,000. And I would really recommend focusing on something 
more like half that. Uh, now, keep in mind, somebody had said, you know, what kind of car, you know, how much of my income should a car be? And so I, I prefer if you save the $25,000 and buy a $25,000 car and pay cash for it and then pay for any maintenance out of pocket and not have that expense. But if you're going to take, you know, part of your income and buy a car, I look at no more than 10% of whatever your net income is. Now, some people do it off a of gross income, you know, whatever. But if you're making $5,000 a month and you're basically, you know, making 60000 a year, uh, at, at a job, uh, that 5,000 a month gross, uh, is 10% of that is about 500 bucks and 500 bucks on a four year loan. You don't want a term that's any more than 48 months. So no 72 month, you know, car loans, you're going to want that particular, um, that particular deal that you're going to make needs to be about 500 bucks a month. So that's about $6,000 in payments uh, a year over four years. You're talking about something that's about $24,000. And uh, that's why I recommend that, you know, you, you know, you don't buy a car that's like $50,000 because, you know, that's going to be closer to a thousand dollars a month. And again, this is your total car payments, not just per car. Uh, you know, your, your total car budget relative to your gross income. Because remember, we just talked about 25 to 40% of your income is going to be your housing. And so your cars, you don't want to be any more than 10%. So that means if you, if you, there's two of you, you know, you and your wife together, uh, then uh, you're going to need to, you know, if, if one's got to be a paid for car in cash and one's got to be a payment, then fine. But understand that the total cost out of pocket uh, on a monthly basis can't be any more uh, then, um, then the ten percent shouldn't be at least, uh, because now you know. Let's say you go as far as the forty percent, which I don't recommend you exceed for a house, and ten percent for a car. Then the only thing you have left is uh, about fifty percent of your gross income. Well, you're going to pay twenty percent or, or so in taxes, so that leaves you thirty percent. Well, we haven't paid any other bills. You haven't paid any utilities. You haven't had any food. You haven't gone out to, a, you know, on Friday nights to a bar. You haven't gone on any vacations. You haven't done anything. You haven't saved or invested. And again, I think that you need to put a minimum of, of 10%, uh, preferably 20% into savings and investments. And so um, that means that, you know, if you're paying 20% in taxes and 20% in uh, in savings and investing, that leaves you only 10% of your income for food and other things. Well, that's like $500 a month if you're making $60,000 a year. So that's not a whole lot of money. I mean, you know, you go to the grocery store, you know, every week, that means you can only spend like $125 and you can't go out and you can't pay your cable bill or your phone bill or any of the other stuff. So uh, then you start going, well, maybe I only need to invest 10% of my income. But again, I believe that everybody should invest 10% of their or 20% of their take home pay because I think that you need to get to $1000 a month that you're putting into investments and savings. And uh and if you're making $60,000 a year and you only have a mortgage that uh costs 25% of your take home and your cars are only 10%, that leaves you an extra 15% that most people don't actually you know, take advantage of. So the benefit there is that, you know, you need to prioritize based on what really should be important. You know, people that don't save and don't invest, don't get to take advantage of compounded interest. You know, if you were, if you, if you get a 30 year mortgage and you, you, uh, and you have a minimum amount. Uh, so, you know, if you don't want to go for the, the 15 year mortgage, if you're going to go for the, uh, the 30 year mortgage, at least go for the 30-year mortgage that's 25% of your take-home. Because again, that gives you the amount of money that you need to put that $1,000 a month into your in savings and investments. And um, that model is really important because that saving and investing, you know, when you're 20, all the way until you're 60, that 40 years will give you $1.8 million worth of 
worth of money that you've saved. And even if you do nothing else, even if you never, you know, you don't have a pension, you don't contribute to any of the retirement plans, you don't do anything other than fund your investments over that period of time, put it in a Roth IRA, put it in an index fund, uh, no load mutual fund, an index of the Dow and the S&P 500. Over that 40 years, you'll have $1.8 million. You'll already have a paid for house because we talked about you know paying for your house. You'll have paid for cars because you're going to drive something till the wheels fall off. But the reality for that is definitely that um, you know you need to maximize the potential for your income by using that money very effectively. And that's the number one thing people don't do. They end up uh, getting a 30-year mortgage for the 40% or more that they'll qualify for because they want a great house and a great neighborhood with a pool and stuff like that. And then they don't have enough to make the necessary investments. So instead of $1.8 million in their savings account, because they only put $500 away, they have more like $600,000. And the $600,000 isn't going to last you very long in retirement. And you've also missed out on $1.2 million worth of other stuff. And that extra $1.2 million, your house isn't worth an extra $1.2 million. Your cars aren't worth an extra $1.2 million. So you missed out on all the things that really matter uh, because you were spending money in the wrong way. So that's what I wanted to do. And I, 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 I wanted to address these two things for cars and, uh, and houses and why you need to follow these simple rules. 25% uh, of your income uh, goes to your house. 10% uh, of your income goes to all your cars uh, or pay cash. And uh, if you, on your mortgage, if you can get a 25, a, a, a um, a 15-year mortgage instead of a 30-year mortgage, uh, then uh, you're going to be much better off, and uh, and that's great. It's a smaller house, but you know what? You're asleep most of the, you know you're at work a third of the time. You're asleep the other third of the time. You know what the hell do you need a really big house for anyway? It's just more to clean and more to take care of, more to pay for. You know, and uh, is it really worth working the extra four hours a day? Uh, you know, uh, you know, in order to be or looking for overtime or that second job or that side hustle, just to have a bigger house for the minimum amount of time you're actually there. You know, chances are probably not. And uh, for damn sure, as somebody who bought 54 cars in the last 27 years, and I've had just about everything there is, uh, I definitely do not recommend spending any more than necessary on cars. So um, I'm going to take a look at the questions here. Uh, we're at almost the 30-minute mark. Uh, I want to kind of keep this shorter than some of the others I've done. But um, and so uh, for the people that are commenting, so uh, somebody asked the question about the house in my in my answer about, uh, you know, about cars. And so I typed the answer in the comments and then I decided to ask the question, you know, when is it OK to buy a million dollar house? And uh, and so people are like uh, commenting. They're like, gee, are you OK? Like, dude, I'm fine. I'm not. I'm not asking for myself. I'm asking because somebody else had the question. So, uh, yeah. I mean, my my house is actually, uh, you know, half a million dollars, uh, a little more than that actually, about closer to six hundred thousand right now. Uh, but the house that I had before this uh, ended up being about one point two, one point three million. Uh, and I got tired of having a million dollar house and paying millions of dollars for it, uh, or tying up that much money. Uh, you know, I took the money that I was spending uh, on the other houses and I put it into my businesses and uh, in stuff that needed it. So, okay. So I'm going to take a look at the questions. I'm going to do Instagram first and then I'll go over here to YouTube. So hang on a second. All right, let's go back through the questions here. All right. Um, it's a struggle starting for work each day. How do I overcome that? You know, dude, you know, you just have to man up. I mean, you know, you're not a fucking child anymore. I mean, you know, uh, if everybody, uh, you know, just wanted to stay home and they couldn't get motivated, you know, just real. I mean, it sounds like you're not doing something you enjoy doing. I, I get up every day enjoying what I do. But, you know, you've got to get past that. You know, I mean, it's a job. You know, it's called a job for a reason. You're not supposed to enjoy it. Uh, but, you know, if you're lucky, you do enjoy what it is. And, um, but you know, enjoying your job is not a requirement, so you just have to do it. And if you don't like your job, you can always get another one. 
But, um, all right. So, let's see what else we got here. Um, okay. Uh, how do you become more decisive? Uh, well, you know, uh, I just think that over the years, um, again, I think it's a maturity thing. It's a matter of growing up and being more mature and realizing that, you know, you have to make decisions. You have to be more decisive. You're never going to have enough information to make a decision that you're comfortable with. So um, it just is what it is. So don't worry about that. You know, uh, just make the best decision you can with the information you have and hope that it's the right one. If it's not, learn from the mistakes, uh, adjust your decision making and go on from there. Okay, let me see. So I'm going to take on YouTube now and see what we got here on questions on YouTube. Got lots of comments. I appreciate you guys on YouTube. Well, that's expensive, but in Mumbai, a thousand square foot flat costs about three hundred thousand dollars to five hundred thousand to three fifty. Yeah, that's that's pretty expensive for for that. Um, yep, uh, the banks set that up that way to get their interest first and hold you, uh, and and hope that you sell it uh, in the first ten years and upgrade to your bigger home starting the cycle all over again and giving them more interest. Yeah, actually, DL, it's actually worse than that. Uh, you know, so uh, not only is it set up that way to keep you poor and keep you dependent on the banks and to make the banks rich, but it's actually worse than that. Uh, they do it on purpose, hoping you'll have to relocate, hope you can't make your payment, hope that it doesn't work for you, and hoping that they can actually get you to, if you, they don't get you to sell your house, they hope to refi, and when you do the refi, uh, like I did, um, you know, at the 20-year mark, uh, you know, after 10 years, the Home Affordability Act, you know, came into place under Obama, and they're like, oh, refi. And by the time I read the fine print, I'm like, are you kidding me? They're going to redisclose the loan, and, and I have to pay a majority of interest all over again. It's all bullshit. So, uh, hey, Gordon, how would you invest $100,000 in cash? In today's environment, uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, Haywood, that's a that's a pretty hard question. Um, I don't have a specific answer right now. Uh, I would invest in yourself, or uh, frankly, uh, you know, having worked in venture capital and private equity, uh, I still think that's a good place to put it. Uh, you know, these days, great points. People who capitalize on property as investments uh, are the professionals. Uh, well, I, I think that, you know, multifamily real estate uh, and apartments and other things like that can be pretty good. That is, if people have jobs and they're able to pay their mortgage. Uh, not so here recently. And, uh, you know, landlords have been, uh, you know, hard pressed to make their own payments because their tenants aren't paying. Uh, how much would it cost to develop an app that helps people rent out their goats for milk and cheese making? Don't know, man. Uh, can it be possible to become a professional goat herder? I don't know, DL. Good luck with that one. If I want to face, uh, if I want to race a used Mustang, how many horses would I need uh, for my carriage to beat it? Yeah, well, DL, you're going to get yourself blocked. So it's all good. These are just jokes playing with you. Yeah, well, you know, any more jokes, DL, and I'm going to block you. So. Very good to hear. Thanks, Gordon. Uh, what about purchasing homes to utilize as rental properties? Uh, we talked about that. Uh, you know, it's not bad if people are paying their rent, but these days most people aren't paying their rents and hoping not to get evicted. Uh, and don't buy Land Rovers. Yeah, well, Land Rovers certainly uh, have, have been problematic. Uh, why don't you have the 54 cars in a garage like Jay Leno? Because I got tired of them. I mean, I, I bought and sold them. Uh, you know, I lost a minimum amount on each one. Uh, you know, if I held on to them, it would be a bunch of, you know, money tied up in cars. Uh, cars that don't, you know, typically appreciate in value. Uh, personal opinion. Uh, what's the meaning of the sh of uh, shorter because there's no... Is there... Is the meeting shorter because there's no cigar? <laughs> no, the meeting is shorter because my wife needs help with dinner. So, uh, and uh, so I'm trying not to make these as long as some of the others. Uh, some of the comments I got was, please don't make them, you know, an hour. So, all right, fine, whatever. Uh, how many businesses do I own? What are they? And what services do they provide? That's a much longer question, DL. So I'm going to leave that for another time. 
Uh, do I think real estate is better with 6% cap rate, 3% interest rate compared to investing in stocks? I don't. Uh, I mean, I just don't. I don't like real estate as an investment because it requires uh, so much upfront. Now, if you have, if you're in a real estate investment trust or other types of private equity or investment banking leveraged uh, large real estate deals, I think it could be very, uh, uh, very lucrative. Uh, but it requires an enormous amount of capital. Uh, wow, man up. You're very good. Uh, you're the man, Gordon. Thanks. I appreciate it. Uh, when to quit my job and start a business? I'm 24 now. Uh, the time to quit your job uh, is really uh, after you have gotten the new job, uh, producing more income in a month than you're going to make in six months to a year. Uh, and you've got six months worth of money saved. I recommend everybody do uh, you know, their prime, you know, do a job and have their job pay for, uh, whatever thing that they're doing on the side and have that thing make money. Uh, plus the government is backstopping tenants, uh, with eviction moratoriums. I know. Well, unfortunately they're still getting evicted. So, um, yeah, I, I appreciate that DL. You don't know my sense of humor. Uh, and, uh, I get that. But, you know, I'm trying to help people here and your bullshit comments, uh, you know, aren't helpful. So if you got something to contribute, great. If you don't, then fuck off. You know, I don't need your bullshit. So uh, what do I think uh, of Ben Mala? So I don't know Ben. I mean, I do know I've, I've watched his stuff and um, and, I, you know, I think that uh, he invests in hotels and other large properties uh, and hotels are are kind of just sucking ass right now. So, um, but, um, you know, it is what it is, but, uh, I I like Ben and I I like his no nonsense, no bullshit kind of thing. Uh, you know, I like, you know, it looks like Ben is not a guy to refuse lunch or dinner. So I'd love to buy him lunch or dinner sometime. I mean, I think it would be a lot of fun, but, uh, you know, uh, so Ben, you know, hit me up, man. You know, I, uh, I'm, 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 I'll be down in Miami where, where I think you're in Miami area. Uh, I'm headed down there here shortly. Uh, I'd love to, uh, I'd love to get together. So, uh, so the question from Instagram and, and this will be the, one of the last questions, uh, do I think Trump will win the election? Uh, well, you know, I'm going to keep, uh, my political views to myself. Uh, you know, I think Trump has, um, you know, Trump has had his chance, uh, to do stuff, uh, here and, uh, um, you know, it's just, um, uh, you can talk about whether he did enough or did too little or whether there should be a federal, you know, tighter federal restrictions or the governor should all get on the same page or whatever. You know, all I can say is that, you know, I have friends all over the world and COVID is not killing a thousand people a day in other countries and like it is here. So, you know, uh, I was never a, flan of, a fan of flattening the curve. I'm, I'm a herd immunity kind of guy. So, and, and I know that's a horrible thing to say. I mean, but I think that other countries hit a spike, they dealt with it as best they could, and then the spike fell off because everybody who was going to get it got it. And uh, thankfully, the only benefit to right now is that uh, everybody who is getting the infection rates are higher, but the death rates are going down because the strain that has evolved or has mutated, uh, on COVID, uh, is more infectious, but less lethal. So thank God. So more people are testing positive, uh, but fewer people are dying from it. So I think that's good. But again, uh, the, we don't need a vaccine if everybody just gets it. And if you're going to get it, you know, if you get it and you build up the antibodies and you're good, then you're good to go. Uh, you don't need a vaccine. Uh, and uh, so I, I think that uh, I would much rather have seen us uh, leave the country open, let people get it and die, uh, or not die, and uh, and develop the immunity, deal with the situation in the healthcare system as best we could, and then we would be back to normal by now, like every other country in the world. Uh, so, you know, that I think is going to play a major role in who wins the election. Let me see. There's one more question on uh, on YouTube that I wanted to get to. Um, did you see that American Airlines is ceasing operations in Oakland? I'm not surprised. Uh, what's a good way to build a side business? Do you hire employees while you're still an employee? And is that a good idea? Yeah, DL. So uh, you redeemed yourself with that question. 
So uh, that's actually exactly what I did. So while I was um, employee number one, uh, there were five other or four other employees, uh, five employees total, including myself, before I transitioned to my company full time. Uh, I spent, I opened the company in, in 93, we incorporated in 94, and I made the transition uh, in, um, in February of 97. And, uh, after starting the company in November of 93. So, uh, I spent three years, uh, working my regular job at the university, uh, while I was actually growing the company and adding more employees. So we made, I made sure we had enough money and enough projects coming in, uh, to pay the employees and to pay all of our expenses. And, and then only then when we had a sufficient backlog of, of work, did I focus on uh, paying myself? And uh, so very good question. Thanks, Deal. Uh, I won't block you now. So um, does more testing mean more deaths due to COVID as the death rate to COVID is the same everywhere? It's not the same everywhere. So uh, so that's that's not the case. And I talked about that. It's, it's not, you know, the infection rate. And people talk about the number of positive cases. The number of positive cases is one thing. Uh, which is is spiking. Uh, the number of deaths uh, is still very high, uh, but the death rate per numbers of positive cases has gone down. Uh, is the strain is the strain is less le less lethal, or is the virus infecting more people in their twenties and thirties of a low risk of death, or both? Perhaps. Yeah. No, I think that that's uh, entirely possible. Um, you know the. Um, uh, I, I do know for a fact that this current strain that's in the U.S. at least uh, is less lethal. Uh, that's just a fact. Uh, and, uh, and the infection rate is higher and it's infecting young, younger and younger people in their 20s and 30s. Uh, but those people are not dying. Now, whether that's because they're more healthy or they have better access to health care and it does, you know, affect poorer and minority communities more, but that's more a socioeconomic with access to healthcare kind of problem and, and things like that. So anyway, um, was I an LLC before I incorporated? No, uh, because uh, in fact, LLCs, I, I, I started the company and uh, we're an S corporation uh, and um, LLCs had just become a thing uh, in, uh, 19, in the nine, early 90s. Uh, and it was not very common uh, to be an LLC back then. Now, some of my uh, companies that I've created since have all been LLCs, uh, whether it's a multi-member or single-member LLC, uh, they've all been LLCs. Uh, and um, so, uh, but uh, my original company, G3, uh, was always a, a corporation. All right, what is my economic outlook regarding South Africa? I think South Africa has some enormous opportunities. I, I, I like Ghana, Nigeria, uh, and South Africa, uh, as well as uh, Zimbabwe and a few other places. And, um, you know, I, I'm looking at opportunities, uh, you know, throughout Africa right now. And uh, I think it's going to be, um, it's going to be good. Um, so... Uh, yeah, it's in terms of, so the question that I'm, uh, I was getting about the LLC, talking about the business being profitable, uh, when I originally, I, I did it originally as a sole proprietor or just as a consulting gig uh, from, 90, from November of 93 to November of 94. And then I, I incorporated it because we had a level of income prior to our 94 year uh, that, I mean, the first year from November of 93 to December 31st of 93 was like two months. So we had like $10,000 in revenue. And then we had substantially more revenue in our second year in 1994. So we changed to a corporation in 94 to facilitate uh, some of the advantages that were available for that. So anyway, look, I'm way past uh, uh, the uh, time. My wife is uh, needing me to uh, help with dinner. Uh, so, uh, I will say that I do have my red banded, uh, watch on, uh, and my red, uh, uh, Lamy Safari pen. Um, uh, and, uh, again, I'll, I, this is my, uh, this is, you know, the Kevin O'Leary collection as I like to jokingly call it, but, uh, you know, Kevin is famous for his red watch bands on various watches and, uh, and things like that. 
And, and Kevin, I told you, you know, uh, if you uh, message me, uh, I will send you $2 every time I appear on camera with a red watch band and my red Lamy pen, which you don't have, but, uh, you know, the, uh, the red accessory thing, uh, you know, I consider it a royalty, you know, you kind of made this red watch band thing popular. You deserve to get paid, my friend. You deserve to make your royalty. I will send you $2 every time I appear on camera with a red watch band. Send me your cash app. That's all I'm saying. All right. Well, listen, guys, I appreciate it. It's been fun. Uh, I, you know, this is an impromptu live at five. Uh, I'm going to see if I can go live uh, more often. Uh, I miss you guys. I enjoyed yesterday with a cigar, finally, for the first time in a while. And uh, look forward to uh, doing this again. Thank you all very much. Love you. Ciao.